Scholarly communication is an ongoing, multi-threaded debate about a topic. One rule of that debate is that everything has to be based on evidence and reasoning. That's where primary sources come in. Primary sources are the evidence. Secondary sources are other scholars' interpretations of the evidence, and they help support and back up your reasoning. You write your paper based on primary source evidence, but you can't write a paper with evidence all by itself because you can't know if you have something new and useful to contribute to the conversation until you've read what other people are saying. You can't be sure of your interpretations until you've assessed the strengths and weaknesses of others. That's when you go to the secondary sources, other scholars' books, articles, and conference presentations about your topic. Whenever anyone, including you as a student, do an experiment and gather data or observe a phenomenon and take notes, whenever you interview someone for an oral history or record an event, you're creating a primary source. And when you write a research paper based on the evidence from primary sources plus your own original ideas, then you're creating a secondary source. By now, you've probably arrived at what librarians usually tell students at the beginning. Primary sources are the closest to the event or phenomenon being studied. They're first-hand accounts, direct and indirect evidence, recordings, and things like that. Secondary sources are one step away from that, and tertiary sources are one more step removed. So what are those tertiary sources? They're learning tools. Textbooks and reference books are tertiary sources. They summarize and synthesize what's already known. You go to them for definitions, facts and figures, instructions, and background information, but you don't cite them in your research papers because they're not original research. You don't want added layers of interpretation and simplification. You want to give credit to the original researcher or the person who came up with the idea, and you want the facts and ideas in as close to pristine form as you can get them. Let's wrap things up with this dilemma. It's obvious that a video of a speech by Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher is a primary source. It's direct evidence. But audio-video recordings are a relatively recent invention. 19th century Prime Minister William Gladstone's speeches were recorded in writing, a medium that leaves a lot of room for the person doing the recording to put their own slant on things. And yet written transcripts of speeches are still primary sources. They're evidence, but some evidence is more reliable than others. As a researcher, you need to take into account that some kinds of primary sources provide evidence not only of the phenomenon that you're studying, but also of the quirks and flaws of the medium and the personal, cultural, personal and cultural viewpoints of the people who created them.